Peter Hatsoglu, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Was it a baby here, Laban? Peter, Urban Dictionary doesn't yet define the name Hatsoglu, but it does define the name Peter. It's described as Peter is a handsome man and very caring. He's good for children to look up to and would make a great husband slash father. He has had a lot of family issues, but doesn't show it. I love Peter. How close to reality is that for Peter Hatsoglu? Becoming a husband is a long way off, I think. <laughs> uh, caring, yeah, sure. I, uh, I'd see myself as caring, I guess. Um, for now, I'm still trying to work that out, I guess. I'm still young. I suppose you're meant to work out who you are when you're young. So I don't know what dictionary you're looking at, but... Urban I'll, Dictionary. I'll, urban Dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> And just to give you some context, Deutsch in the Urban Dictionary is the space between the bed and the wall that you can fall in. So it's uh, it's very ambiguous, very obscure, but I'm hoping one big Peter Hatsoglu fan might pick up on this interview and create their very first Peter Hatsoglu entry in Urban Dictionary. I think that's a very worthwhile cause. <laughs> Peter, it's a... A real thrill to have you on the podcast today. You are joining some extraordinary cricketers in the form of Justin Langer, the current Australian coach, Ryan Harris and Chris Rogers. How does it feel to be included amongst those names? Yeah, look, I mean, um, when you release those podcasts, what, six, six, 12 months ago, I was, uh, I was just a club cricketer, I suppose. Uh, watching on, trying to trying to soak up as much information as I could, and at heart, I am still a club cricketer. Um, but I suppose in that space of time now, a lot's happened for me um, after having played in the Big Bash um, over this summer. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> to be included amongst those names is is pretty special, for sure. Well. One of the things that really st stuck out to me, Peter, was, and, and this, this interview is unashamedly going to be cricket focused. For all you cricket nuffies out there, this is one for you guys and girls. I had a look through the My Cricket stats, which in Australia is the, for all the registered cricket players, and you and I had an opportunity to play a game in the fourth grade. And they're talking about this meteoric rise from third grade to the Big Bash and then uh, state cricket. But it actually goes back a bit further than that. <laughs> I still remember that game. We are playing against Essendon at Cross Keys Reserve. Um, and it was Camberwell at, oh, I can't remember the name, but we played Camberwell together in our first game, potentially, but definitely Essendon. In definitely our Essendon. Game. Yeah, that's it. Pretty remarkable. And this is at Melbourne University Cricket Club for those nuffies that want to go back through all the archives and the record. This is 2017-18 from, from my memory, which is not that long ago. Since that time, you've progressed through the ranks, uh, debuting with the Melbourne Renegades and Big Bash of 2020-21. Recently debuting for the South Australian team, and my guess is by the time this interview comes out, maybe even picked for the Australian team. Am I being a bit ambitious? I think the Australian team's a long way off at the minute, but you know, it's a funny game. Uh, COVID's a, an interesting environment and anything can happen. I mean, for me to get into the Renegades uh, squad, uh, two leg spinners um, were made unavailable because of one, because of COVID, the other one because of a heart issue. So. I mean, it's an interesting landscape and, and I think it's proven that anything can happen. So, uh, you know, who knows what the future holds? Don't have a crystal ball, but, um, but for sure, that's the ambition one day. Well, I suppose it's, it's all of a sudden become very attainable, isn't it? It's only two, three, five fifths away from maybe being picked in the, in the national squad. And, and one of the reasons for wanting to bring you on the podcast today, Peter, was to really share with the world your, or at least in my opinion, your extraordinary approach to life. In the time that we've we've known each other, you've always had this really wonderful 
bright disposition. But one thing I've come to really know about you is you're incredibly competitive on the field. And I'd love for you to share with our audience today, if you can, how did you develop that skill and technique? Mm. Well, look, I, um, I, I still remember so clearly I was, I just finished high school. I was playing at my local cricket club, Sunshine Heights Cricket Club. And um, at this time I was uh, more of a typical leg spin bowler who bowled slower, tried to turn the ball, um, tried to emulate someone like Shane Warne. Uh, as I discovered, that's something that's very difficult to do. Um, and I figured, right, it's not really working. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try and do things my own way. And at the same time, I had um, the coach at the time, Luke Simpson, suggest to me that I bowl with some more energy through the crease. Um, to me, energy at the crease meant um, running in a bit faster, uh, putting more power into it, but not only, um, I suppose, physical energy, but also um, energy with um, energy with you know my mouth, my emotions, my um, my just just my just putting everything into it. Um, not necessarily sledging or anything like that. I, I, I'm not really into any of that, but just just being really um, just being a bit of a buzz. I suppose, really zesty. And as that developed, um, I, I sort of became, became my own bowler, I guess. And um, I went into every, every sort of competition knowing that I, um, if I were to, to bowl my best, I would have to um, have high energy. When you've got high energy, you put more revs on the ball. When you put more revs on the ball, the ball will spin more, the ball will drift a bit more um you know it might slide on it might spin and bounce so the, the the key word behind it is energy and then and then the other the other part to it all is having having confidence um and you almost need to go or i've found that i almost need to go through like an inner process of um convincing myself that i'm good enough to to play at whatever level it may be i still remember my first my first game in the second 11 at Melbourne uni against Paran. Um, my figures were none for 40 of 10 overs. And that was probably one of the, the few games where I, where I started to sort of doubt myself. I thought, you know, maybe, you know, we're on the, we're on the big grounds now we're off the third and fourth 11 grounds um, where, you know, this is a big time. And, and that was one of the very few times I suppose I've, I've thought, Fuck, maybe maybe I'm not good enough to play this level, and and the results the results showed. But after um after returning later on to to the second eleven, I, I came back with a very different approach, and it was a year later, but also against Paran Cricket Club, and I remember I took Pfeiffer, um had a totally different approach to it, um and I um yeah and and I suppose I got a totally different uh, outcome. Um, mm. You talk about energy at the crease, Peter, and, and I suppose does that translate into higher vibrational frequency from you? I'm not sure. I'm very spiritual. I've been very open about the things that I believe in on this on this podcast. I'm not religious at all, but I'm very spiritual, and I believe in that very high vibrational frequency that that I think maybe you might be describing in this energy at the crease. What, what, what do you mean exactly by vibrational friction? <laughs> I'm going to probably butcher this, but the, the concept is around the energy is this constant uh, vibrational force. And the higher your vibrational frequency, seemingly the better things are. If you've got a very low vibrational frequency, you're a bit dull and you, know, you, have, you don't have that energy. Um, yeah. But the opposite would be that you are you know, in that, in that flow state, I suppose is a good way of describing it. Yeah, no, well, well, that's funny you say that because I, I remember prior to me um, sort of transforming myself a little bit and, and becoming this high energy, um, you know, high, high pace bowler. My dad would always say to me, Peter, your body language is shocking. Like your body language is just shit. 
and and I thought, oh right, I, it's like at the time I wouldn't I wouldn't feel like my body language is um is ordin- is it was ordinary. Um, this is on the cricket field, mind you. Um, but uh, I yeah yeah I, I I suppose with with changing my approach and becoming more of a um, energetic bowler and zesty bowler, I suppose. I, I subsequently had, um, had better body language and, and I, I just, I, I, I suppose I sent the message of, right, I'm here for the contest. I'm here to get you out. I'm not here to give you, you know, give you an easy, uh, an easy way out. Oh, it's a, it's a really great description, Pete. And, and I think really important for anyone that's, that's, I mean, you don't have to be young to appreciate this kind of, uh, insight. You did so well in your first year in the Big Bash that they awarded you the Rookie of the Year uh, award, which is a phenomenal, phenomenal achievement. There's a lot of really great players debuting in the Big Bash uh, this season just gone. What was that like, receiving that honour? Yeah, like, amazing. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I I went into the Big Bash with no real eye on on my stats or anything like that or, or the outcome. I, I just thought... Um, I'm, I'm going to take it literally ball by ball, not even game by game, but ball by ball um, and and try and get the best outcome for myself that I possibly can. Um, and I, I suppose with um, with a focus on just doing my job and, and a focus on what what um, what I can do to get a better outcome for the team uh, really helped me helped me along in, in getting awards like that, I suppose. It's it's funny how how the individual accolades come when you've got no focus on what the individual outcome is. And then when you do think about the individual outcome, that's when your performance is tends to be worse. At least that's what I've found. I've got no science to back that up whatsoever. Um, <laughs> no statistics. <laughs> but but I've always found that you perform considerably better when you're thinking about the team outcome rather than the individual outcome. Well, I think it really comes through in the way that you play, Peter. And and, and maybe I'm a little bit biased just because I've I know you I know you a little bit and I like you a lot. But the energy, the the way that you conduct yourself, uh, the way that you exploded onto the scene was a real self confidence, not arrogance at all, but a real self confidence and a real self belief that you were deserved to be in the place that you were. And that and that came through, and that's why you had such a, an extraordinary season in a team that really got its backside handed to it, which which can make it even harder to perform in many cases as well. Yeah, I, I suppose. Um, yeah, I like, I like for sure when the team's not performing as well, you know, the cracks start to uh, open up a little bit more. But um, look, uh, I suppose when you're when you're in a team that's not winning either, you 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 might get a bit more sort of opportunity, whereas um, you wouldn't if you're on the periphery and um, and the team's winning and that sort of thing. So, um, uh, yeah, look, uh, all that all that said, I still had some pretty amazing mentors around me, you know, like guys like Aaron Finch. I, like, I had access to him every day. Like, how often do you get that? Um, you know, Kane Richardson, Sean Marsh, it, it goes on. Um, and and uh, I suppose I suppose yeah we weren't winning but still had some amazing people to fall back on and some amazing uh, mentors that I could learn off and and develop from. So uh, all that being said, it was still a really good um, tournament for for my own personal development and for the development of a lot of the other guys in the team as well. We had you know Jake Fraser McGurk, Mackenzie Harvey, um, a lot of these guys who were early on in their careers. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure they took enormous amounts away from it as well. One of my favorite quotes, and I, I can't recall the guy that, that came up with it talks about, if you look at your life in five years, you'll be the sum parts of the books that you read and the people that you spend the time around. And I'm a huge believer in, in the, the power of surrounding yourself with people that will lift you up. How has that impacted you being around people like Aaron Finch and Marshy and these other amazing, amazing people. Um, yeah, <laughs> like it's um, 
look, it's difficult to measure the um, the impact, I suppose, but like the obvious answer is enormous. It's it's to have to have um, like like cricket cricketers who've who've done it um, at the highest possible level, who've who've you know gotten as close as you can to conquering the game, I guess. To have um, to have those people um, in your court offering advice, um, like Aaron Finch would would make adjustments in the field when I was bowling, and and it was um, it was funny how he he just after literally like one or two games he'd almost worked me out as a bowler, um, and after having spoken to me for a little bit as well. Um, he just works me out, and he could and he could read the play so well, and um, he could he could read what the bat, batter was doing as well as what I was going to do as well. So to have those guys um, there helping you look further forward into the game um, develops your understanding enormously. So that comes into play when you're adjusting fields, when you're um, you know working out what sort of ball you want to bowl. But then beyond that as well, I mean, navigating um, professional sport off the field is is something that's um, look. There there are a lot of great things that come with being a professional sports person. It's it's a pretty amazing lifestyle. Um, but there there are a lot of things. Look, it, it can be uh, I suppose bureaucratic in the background as well. And and there are a lot of um, different uh, different things you need to navigate. Um, when you're when you're off the field and having those guys around to to bounce ideas off and and to to speak to is is invaluable as well you've had some or access to some amazing people and some amazing mentors in your rise through the ranks from a a junior through to where you are now is there any of them that stick out to you as being sort of key figures yeah for sure i mean um Look, going back to the early days, I think everyone. Uh, I did a I did a junior presentation night at a at a cricket club called Modbury Modbury Hawks Cricket Club here in Adelaide, and I think every every like I feel like every junior who's been successful um, and made it um, later on in their in their senior career has had one um, sort of prolific figure at, at, at some stage along the way, but in particular in their formative years as a junior. And, and for me, that was, um, that was uh, a guy named Matthew Shawcross, um, who was my under 13s cricket coach. Um, and really, really, um, a cricket coach for me sort of all the way through, he was, he was the, the guy who, who, um, pushed me to bowl leg spin and, and encouraged me to do that. And, um, he was he was someone who was really great for me personally obviously my dad as well um contributing along the way um enormously um and then later on i had um i had um a guy from my school named david omen who who was um a great sort of cricketing mentor as well and then and then more recently um anthony keely from from melbourne uni cricket club um the head coach who, who, yeah, was, was, was really great for me. Um, and who I'm still in contact with or regular contact with, um, today. I hope I haven't missed anyone. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I, I, I'm sure it's impossible to count all the people that have had an impact, uh, in our, in our lives as we develop and whatever it might be, but certainly shout out to your father, Nick, who, as far as I understand, you weren't that keen to play cricket in your younger days and just were pretty keen to to uh be the main striker for man united in the premier league that's that's exactly right yeah i um yeah i mean uh, it's common for for kids to play a lot of different sports and and for me i played um afl cricket soccer athletics i did a bit of swimming so um you know you do you do a lot of sports when you're younger and and i mean it's always difficult to decide what you like most i suppose but um yeah, it was it was soccer for me uh, for a long time, and um, and I'm glad that my dad continued to uh, push me down the cricket path. Uh, I think it's worked out a while in the end. <laughs> well, you're you're the leader of four, well, three other siblings: Leo, Max, and Alexander. Are you the oldest? I'm the oldest. Yes, I am the oldest. Um, do you 
do you then feel like you've got the responsibility to lead by example? I suppose there's the the natural, uh, you, you naturally feel that. And, you know, from, from when you're young, that your parents always sort of, um, always sort of tell you that you're leading the pack or whatever. Um, yeah, look, all, all my brothers, it's, it's funny how, um, you know, we're, we're all, we're all, we all love our sport. We all love cricket in particular. Um, but yeah, I suppose it's funny how, um, how you might, you might not think that you're, um, you're leading, I suppose, or, or in any way, I guess, but and you said, I'm, I'm certainly not trying to be authoritarian or anything like that, but, um, but yeah, you might, you might have more of an impact than what you think, um, with your, with your younger siblings for sure. Well, I wonder now that you've been able to achieve what you've achieved so far, Pete, that now, you've now broken the limiting belief that the other brothers might have had about playing, uh, certainly in the Big Bash or state cricket or even higher. And I, I wonder what the feasibility of having all four of you play in an international side together might be like. Yeah. Well, I mean, wouldn't that be, um, you know, wouldn't that be amazing? But um, yeah, look, Max is in the South Australian under 19 program. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's trying to do his best to get a contract here and, and work his way through the, through the stages of, um, of the periphery, I guess. Um, you know, Leon Alexander is still at high school, um, almost done with high school, but they both love their cricket and they both play as well. So, you know, dare to dream, I guess, Laban. That'd be amazing. Well, it'd be a damn nightmare for the commentator. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of uh, brothers, y your brother Max was wicket-keeping in a game that you were bowling in against Cameron White, and I wondered if you'd share that amazing story with our audience. Yeah, look, um, I suppose along the way, uh, a lot of things have I've been very fortunate to have things go my way, I guess. Um, there was this one game in particular where where Cameron White played for Melbourne Cricket Club. We were obviously playing for Melbourne University Cricket Club, my brother and I. And um, it was a 2020 match. I was opening the bowling and um, Cameron White was facing me. My uh, my now teammate Sam Harper was at the other end, and um, I, I guess I um, I guess I did well in that game. And sort of towards the end of my spell, I bowled four overs up front. Um, Cameron White turns around to uh, Max, who's who's a wicket keeper. Cameron didn't know that um, that Max is my brother at this stage, and he sort of turns around to Max and goes, "Who is this guy bowling? Who, like, you know, who is he? What's the what's what's the go with him? You know, he's pretty, he's all right. It must be he's pretty handy, I guess." And Max was like, "Oh, yeah, it's Peter Hatsoglu." Cameron goes, "What?" <laughs> no, but um, but <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh, Haven't yeah. you heard of him? Max, <laughs> yeah, Max. Max goes. Um, yeah, he's my brother. Um, uh, what do you reckon? I don't know. And 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 Cameron's like, yeah, all right. And then I mean, a few days later, I found myself um, net bowling to be uh, the Melbourne Stars. Um, so yeah, it, it happened happened quickly in the end, I guess, and and it happened through an un, unexpected channel, but. Um, yeah, how grateful I am for that. <laughs> There's a great lesson for anyone out there with brothers or sisters to always treat them with respect and treat them well, because if they get an opportunity to pump your tires up in front of someone really important or influential, you want them to take that opportunity. And certainly having two brothers, there'd be periods of my life where if Cameron White had spoken to them, they would have told him in under no, no main terms to go whistle. <laughs> Fawad Ahmed, former, well, current Melbourne University player, uh, international Australian one-day bowler, played uh, uh, in more T20 games and T10 games than you can shake a stick at. I know he had an impact on you in your life at, uh, in your early teens. Yeah. Yeah, look, Fawad and I uh, had a chance encounter when he was still playing for Hoppers Crossing Cricket Club. So Fawad had recently settled in Australia. Um, he was playing a bit of cricket um, to, to sustain himself, I suppose, along with um, whatever he was doing for work at the time. Um, Working in a warehouse, I think. I think, yeah, I, yeah. Um, and and I, um, 
through one of my dad's uh, friends, we we worked out a session with Farwad where we we're at the Newport Cricket Club Nets and um, in in uh, in the western suburbs of Melbourne. And uh, Farwad and I were were um, yeah sort of bowling with one another, doing a doing a bit of a one on one, I guess. And and to this to this day, that was my only sort of um, one-on-one coaching experience I guess I, I hadn't had any sort of you know I, I never saw private coaching or anything like that as a, as a kid um and um yeah that that one encounter with Fawad what what sticks out in my mind most was Fuzz was um we told me two things the the first thing was sideways release the ball from sideways but I don't know if anyone has seen me bowl I release the ball from like here Right on top of my head, I've got a really high release. Um, Farwad was saying release from sideways here to get more spin on the ball. And then the second thing I remember from that session was uh, the amount of spin Farwad got. I, I remember him standing there, just just bowling off, you know, two steps, and and he could spin the whole length of the wicket from down leg to to outside off. Um, and and I, I at the time I thought that was that was amazing. Still do because I can't spin the ball, you know. <laughs> 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 <Not at all. laughs> More margins. <laughs> well, I don't think it matters, and, and whatever has sort of eventuated uh, has proved to be very powerful and effective. And uh, uh, your experience with Farlet, who is a, a political asylum seeker, mm. uh, is is not limited to people like Farwad. You've been incredibly influential uh, in the work that you've been doing with Sunshine Heights Cricket Club. And in the western suburbs of Melbourne as well, are you able to share some of that story with our audience? Uh, yeah, look, I suppose um, uh, I've look. <laughs> of course, there are there are always people um, around you who who do a lot of work as well. So and 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 for me, I sort of came along, um, you know, late later on as well, I guess. And uh, there are a lot of people who did the the formative work to get things going in this space at Sunshine Heights. But look, Sunshine Heights has always been a cricket club that. Um, that uh, in, intends to reflect the the community that that it's um that it's that it lives in. So, Sunshine, for those who don't know, is a is a, a suburb sort of twenty minutes west of Melbourne. Um, it's a culturally diverse um, area, um, and and as a result, the the club wanted to reflect its community. So. Um, what that meant was uh, a lot of people, including um, Matthew Shawcross, as I early, earlier mentioned, um, my dad, and 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 many others um, would would uh, yeah would would go along, go on the way, and and try and reflect the 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 community. So what that meant was uh, there were there was uh, one South Sudanese. Um, team that, I, that that sort of that came about so um i shouldn't say south sudanese sorry um because it wasn't entirely south sudanese i mean i was in the team so i'm, I'm I've got the <laughs> very, honorary <laughs> yeah um so there was there was one team it was called the uh Antini team after i can't pronounce his name but makai and Tini, is that right? quarantine yeah. yeah 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 um so there was there was one team sort of uh he has a rather large team, bum uh, yeah, yeah. What's that? Sorry. Yeah, Makai and Tenny has a rather large bum. Okay, right. Very powerful, <laughs> very, very powerful glutes. Yeah, great glutes. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was this team, and and basically this this team um, just tried to get people from the most obscure backgrounds, non traditional cricketing backgrounds, and, and brought people together. So that included um, people from South Sud with South Sudanese heritage, um, people with Ugandan heritage, uh, Greek, I suppose, Greek and Macedonian and Italian, um, and and yeah, we got brought we got brought together, and um, and it wasn't limited to this 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 team only. There were there were a lot of different teams um, at Sunshine Heights with um, with people from non traditional cricketing backgrounds, Vietnamese, for example, as well. So that's sort of the um, the, the the mission of the club, I guess. And um, and I've in recent years, I. I've, become, I've, um, I've joined the, uh, the uh, committee of the club and um, I was the administrator for three years and I'm now the treasurer. So um, 
yeah, so I'm, I guess I'm I'm quite involved, although it's it's becoming more and more difficult being uh, being interstate. But I'm quite involved with the club, um, and and all that sort of stuff as well. Well, you're on more payrolls than you can shake a cricket bat at at the moment. It's all voluntary. That's no, no all... payrolls. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a great quote that Zig Ziglar always said that I, I love to use on this. And he says, you can get whatever you want in this life, Peter, as long as you help enough other people get what they want. And I know that in the work that you're doing, having directly been affected, uh, certainly with a Con Marwian who debuted uh, last season, I think it might have been, 2019 2020 is the very first first grade South Sudanese player in the history of Premier Cricket which was a uh, something really cool to be a part of and he even was playing in in my team in the fourth 11 for the last couple of games just coming back from an injury and we opened the batting together uh, which was a real thrill and um, so that wouldn't have happened without the work that you were doing there so we thank you thank you very much for your service. I want to ask you about your mum and the influence and the impact that she's had in your life to this point. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, look, I mean, I've been, I've been very fortunate to have, have incredibly uh, supportive parents. I guess a lot of people don't, don't have that. And um, look, mum would, my, my mum, I I, I suppose, um, look, my mum, Thinking back to her days when when she was at university, she did engineering, and at that time especially, um, I, I remember her saying that um, it was at that time especially it was a, a really male dominated field, and um, and it's, I, mean, I suppose it's, it still probably is today. Um, but um, I remember Mum saying to me that you know she was one of one of three women who were in her in her um, that that was in the course, um, and and Mum. Uh, yeah, started off her career as an engineer and and was was going really well. That was my understanding, at least. And then sort of gave that up to to raise my brothers and I. Um, so, you know, we we talk about um, being uh, being generous. You know, at the start of this interview, well, I mean, <laughs> generosity doesn't come uh, any better than that, I suppose. Um, giving up your career, giving up your um, your your um yeah your livelihood i guess to, to to raise to raise some kids and um put everything else in the back burner is, is something that's pretty special isn't it um yeah so my mum's still still i suppose a mum i guess still enormously influential in my life today well and i'm sure if you asked her and, and maybe we'll get an opportunity one one day whether she'd do anything different. I, I'm guessing that she probably wouldn't. And I'm curious to know what were the major major attributes that you were able to take from your mum's influence? Um, my, yeah, my mum, um, how would I, how would I, mum's very uh, like artsy. Um, like I remember at, at home we've got, you know, we've got artwork that my mum did uh in year 12 and things like that mum's very artsy sort of against the grain challenges um challenges conformity i suppose i guess in a way and um and that's something that i i find that i do naturally as well um uh yeah i suppose it's a bit a bit bit better to have a point of difference uh than to than to be just like everyone else you know, in, 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 in her nature, I suppose she, uh, she did engineering when no other women did engineering. Um, so I guess, I guess I've taken that away from mum. They say that you're never too old to teach. Uh, you're never too young to learn. What's something that you've learned from either one of your three brothers in the last six months that you hadn't had before? Um, look, Max and I, Max and I regularly talk about cricket, regularly talk about, um, you know, Max has, has an amazing mind for, for sport in particular. Um, 
I remember when we were younger, I used to play the dolls or whatever. And, um, and Max used to play games of footy or games of cricket on the carpet. He used to get marbles and spread them around the carpet with, with an oval and he'd play, yeah, play out games of games of cricket and footy. Um, so he's always had a mind for, um, sporting strategy, I guess. And, and something that Max has, um, recently that we've discussed is sort of, um, uh, where I get, where I get, where runs leak with my bowling. So I, I, I get hit, I get hit square of the wicket. Um, sorry, this isn't very philosophical or anything. <laughs> <laughs> if that's what you were hoping for. This something that this is something that um, that Max and I have discussed recently. Um, yeah, just just working out where exactly runs get get hit off my bowling. We figured out, or Max figured out that. I get hit square of the wicket a lot more than what I do straight down the ground. So that's something we've discussed recently. That's something that I've learned from my brother. <laughs> Philosophical or not, Peter, it'll be fascinating to see how you bowl next season and to see whether you're able to dry up in those areas. And we can thank Max Matty Hats uh, for his contribution and give him a shout out as well, Peter. What's the name of his 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 podcast and his channel that he's he's on? Yeah, the, the Sports Hour is what it's called. He's uh, Interviews, interviews, uh, sports people uh, on the administrative side, and also sports players, and um, and yeah, check it out on Twitter. I suppose he's pretty active there. Peter, what would you say your relationship with umpires has been like over the course of your life? Um, yeah, I, I, that's it's funny you ask that. It's a, it's a it's a question that I suppose you very rarely get asked. Look. Um, Naturally, um, or umpiring is such a difficult, such a difficult job, and you know players have enormous expectations on on umpires, and um, when you get it wrong, and um, and naturally, I mean, human errors always going to be um, always going to be a an element at play with umpiring. Um, uh, a lot of guys tend to tend to freak out, I suppose, and have a goal at them and, and, it, and it exaggerates a bit more when it's, you know, the, the highest stakes of a professional sport. Um, I mean, I mean, um, not, not to say that I ever freak out at umpires or anything like that. Um, I, I mean, anyone who knows me certainly wouldn't say I, um, I'm, I'm that way inclined at all. Uh, my relationship with them, my relationship with umpires is, as as my relationship with anyone else is, I suppose I'm I'm a pretty friendly guy, I think, and and I'm um, you know, I don't bite. <laughs> I'm uh, I don't know. <laughs> I know a real good answer to this, please. It was a real loaded question because something rather extraordinary happened this year. You took your very first wicket at state level, an yep. LBW decision, I believe, that was reversed by Donovan Kosh. Yes. In what I believe to be a first ever <laughs> at state level. Are you able to share that story with us? Yeah, look, I mean, naturally, uh, I was bowling to um, Cameron Bancroft and Sam Whiteman. Uh, for, they were playing for WA. And, and um, yeah, I was bowling to Whiteman and, um, and he sort of played, played a miss at one. Admittedly, he didn't hit it. Didn't hit it at all. Um, but there was a sort of a noise and, and the umpire, we, we naturally appeal, the umpire gave it out. And, and as he sort of gave it out, our appeal had died down to accept the not out decision. <laughs> so, so yeah, he reversed his decision. And, um, and I mean, I give him a lot of credit for that as well, because it's, it's, um, it's, it's difficult to do, I guess, to, to, um, admit you're wrong sometimes. Um, so yeah. Got to, got to pay some respect to Donovan, I think. It's yeah, it is rather remarkable. I, I've got a theory about um, LBW decisions or or appeals for court behind LBW, whatever it might be, that where it where it's uh, you know it could go either way. Mm -hmm. I really feel like there's a pitch that my voice hits that triggers some kind of nervous reaction in the umpire's body that just propels his his out finger. And I, again, I've got no science at all to back this up, but do you believe that there might be some truth to this? 
there are, and, and this has been spoken about, um, there probably should be some sort of um, study that goes into this because I'm, I'm sure it would be pretty valuable for a lot of different guys. But um, look, there, there is an art to appealing and, and you know, like there are so many, so many close calls. And when you haven't got DRS in first class cricket, um, the sometimes, you yeah, know, when you're on the edge, you, you as an umpire, you just, you're looking to the, looking to, um, uh, to sort of gauge how out it is from, from the blokes, from the blokes appealing, I guess. Um, so yeah, for sure. Um, there's, there's a, there is a massive art to it. Um, I can't tell you what the art is exactly. It's just sort of, for me, it's just a natural explosion of, um, energy, as I said, um, hope, <laughs> um, yeah, but, but if you can, uh, do whatever you do, whatever you can to, to help convince the umpire, help sway him your way. Cause I think the lesson is that there'll be times when something really plumb will not be given. And, uh, there'll be other times with the opposite, opposite will happen. I think as a long-term cricketer, you take, take everything you can get. <laughs> Unless you're Adam Gilchrist and you walk uh, when you've when you've schnicked off, <laughs> well, you've got plenty of runs to spare, I suppose. <laughs> Peter, uh, this might be putting you on the spot, but do you have access to a cricket ball within your reach by any chance? Ooh, I've got a foam a foam cricket ball. That'll do. That'll do. I'm gonna we're gonna do a masterclass and put you on the spot. <laughs> Hold on. For those listening, I'll do my best to describe exactly what's going on, but. I don't want you to give away all your secrets, Peter, but I'd love for you to share with particularly the younger audience. Uh, he's got a, a Melbourne Renegades um, really softball. phone ball. Yeah. Uh, could you share with our audience how to bowl one of your deliveries? And you can choose whichever one that is. So I don't want you to give away any trade secrets. Okay. And if well, you could describe for someone that might be uh, blind, for example, given that people might be listening to this on audio only. Yeah. Okay. Um, Look, I suppose you've got a cricket scene that runs around the ball. Um, yeah, perfectly around the ball. Um, my my sort of um, grip, I suppose, typically you'd have, what's this part of your finger called, David? What would you call it? Like a knuckle sort I, of? I would say that's the top knuckle of your ring finger. Yeah. So top. Oh, that's, that's your right finger. So the opposite hand, if, you, if it goes on your left, that's the right hand side, the top knuckle. Yeah. So if we, if we focus in on the, the, the top knuckle of um, our index finger, middle finger and ring finger, they're the three, they're the three contact points on the ball for me. Um, now, a lot of leg spinners would, would typically line up the, that top knuckle with the seam. You see that there. What I do is I move it around a little bit. Hold on. It's a feel thing. So I can't just like there. I move it around a little bit. So... If you see that, my top knuckle is on the top knuckle of my um, index finger is running right down the middle of the seam. Yeah. Um, the top knuckle of my middle finger is just off the seam. Um, and then the top knuckle of my um, ring finger is sort of well off the seam. You see yeah. That? Sort of like a holding, just holding the ball in place there. Yeah, exactly. Just on the ball in place, and 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 that group there then sort of sits. And this is this is for when I really want to get a bit of extra pace on the ball, and potentially a little bit of slide as well, um, and drift. I um, that's how I sort of hold it, and I'll hold it sort of deep in my hand. Um, whereas a lot of leg spinners will, will hold it sort of loose, and they won't use their thumb at all. My my thumb rests on the ball, so it's like this, like that. And I really focus on just the, the regular spinning it with my third finger, my ring finger, and getting it to go out the back. But with that, with where I adjust the ball in my hand like this, that's where I get the extra, I don't know what it is, just extra. I, I find that it just feels a bit more comfortable and I can get a bit of extra um, fizz. So what, what the other thing I've found is if you want, if I want to slow the ball down, I will, I will um, try and get overspin so the ball stays on my fingers for longer here on my, on my bowling hand, stays on my fingers. So that, that'll help me slow the ball down. But if I'm 
if I'm holding it with that grip that I described earlier, then I find that the ball doesn't stay in my hand for as long and it comes out a bit, um, a bit quicker. Yeah. It's, it's really great, Peter. And, and, uh, I suppose what, what advice for someone that's, that's deciding what they're going to bowl, uh, whether it be pace or spin or medium or, you know, left arm China or whatever, like from, from a leg spin point of view, is it simply just practice, practice, practice? Yeah, for sure. Look, I mean, I mean, um, I think I think any bowler who's been who's been really like really great has probably had a, a point of difference. Not not to say that I'm really great or anything, but like I'm thinking <laughs> like Australian bowlers, you know, um, like Josh Hazelwood. He's got a, a big high release, um, gets good bounce, bowls a heavy ball, and that might be his point of difference. Um, uh, Mitchell Stark can swing a ball and bowl an amazing Yorker um, at pace. That's his point of difference. Pat Cummins um, angles the ball, angles the ball into right-handers, very consistent, doesn't stray, and that and that's his point of difference. His consistency, his continual um, angling in, making the batter play, that sort of thing. Um, you know, James Anderson swings the ball. Warning, turns are huge. Morally, um, bowls all sorts of variations that no one can read. So I think any any bowler who's ever been really great has had a point of difference. Um, they've, they've bowled, whether they've bowled leg spin, off spin, um, fast bowling, medium pace, they've had a point of difference. So whatever a junior chooses to bowl, develop a point of difference, I guess. And, and um, I mean that point of difference creates ambiguity ambiguity um is is a great thing if you're a bowler you know be as difficult as possible for the batter and yeah great advice and i suppose be, be constantly evolving as well and pushing yourself out of your comfort zone sure. um having had the opportunity to interview some extraordinary world-class athletes including olympic gold medalists and all blacks coaches and and obviously people like justin langer the common denominator with a lot of these people and, and not even just sports people like uh, musicians and, and academics is that they have a relentless pursuit of li like lifelong learning. They, you know, they don't finish school and just decide that that's it. They continue pushing and pushing and pushing and that's what sets them apart and, and they become this enigma uh, of, of, you know, what they do. And I think sounds like you've, you've got that mindset in spades, Peter. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, that 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 extends to um, the cricketing field as much as it does to life outside of cricket. I mean, I um, I uh, I study I study finance now, and, and I've got or um, well, my intention is to, whilst I'm playing cricket, continue on with post grad study, um, and um, and yeah, I suppose in all aspects of life, for sure, some learning and. And all that sort of stuff is is critical to um to being successful. Wise words. You've got a few nicknames, pistol, uh, amongst others, but Thumper is one that may not be as well known. And I'm really fascinated to know two things, Peter. Hey, a, how did you get the, the nickname Thumper? And B, when will we see the Thumper celebration when you take a wicket <laughs> in the next big bash? Um, well, yeah, look, um, uh, Thumper came about one day we were playing a, uh, 2020 game at, at Fitzroy, uh, against Fitzroy Doncaster and, um, and Trent Lawford, um, was playing in that game and, uh, his nickname is Thumper and basically, um, he walked out to do the warm up in, um, in a full, full kit ready to play and coincidentally i i did the same thing as well um and uh and wasn't planned or anything obviously i, I don't know the guy at all but um but yeah that's sort of how it, how it came about i guess the nickname and um and the thumper celebration is uh, basically uh how how maybe you can insert can you do that insert the, the footage i don't know but um <laughs> 
but uh, the Thumper celebration is just sort of stomping about. It's um, it's a bit of a piss take, really. I think I, I did it in the second innings of a game that was dead um, <laughs> uh, when, when I did it in the second 11, Melbourne Uni. But, um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good one. That's funny. That <laughs> well, I, I'd love to see it implemented in, in some of this representative cricket, Peter. I think it's... Uh, it's another feather to your extraordinary cap. And and one other thing I'd love to discuss before we wrap this up is this this explosion of this Peter meme that's taken a hold yeah. for fans of Peter Hatsoglu and the Big Bash. Can you share with our audience about what that is all about? Look, I, I suppose um, it's, it's funny how it came about. Um, there are a group of sort of um, like... I say kids, but I think they're about 17, 18 years old. So I think they're just guys that um, that empathise or, or that, that empathise with me, I suppose. Um, that they they must have been involved with their local cricket clubs as well. And um, and I think they they just they they took to the story. They they like the story um, of of my story, I guess. Um, and and how did it come about? They, they, they just literally. Um, there was some post on a random like meme page that you'd think is like a spam account. I don't know. And 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 this post um, got put up was a photo of me after I got in my first wicket and after that first game. And it just said Peter Chain. And then from that, like. 600 people commented Peter and, <laughs> and that sort of then spilled onto, you know, whenever the renegades posted hundreds of people would comment Peter and then sort of just kept on spilling over. Um, and, um, and I guess that's how it all, it all happened <laughs> from a group of kids liking my story. <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. And I, I will confess I've contributed as well. And I would encourage all of our, our audience uh, that are following Peter Hatsoglu. Uh, and, and where can we find you, Peter? Uh, yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm on uh, Twitter as well, just at Peter Hatsoglu. Uh, you spell Hatsoglu for our audience? <laughs> H-A-T-Z-O-G-L-O-U. And just to confirm as well, any other pronunciation is deemed invalid and not correct at all. <laughs> I mean, look, it's a difficult one to pronounce, I suppose, but Hatsoglu is the is the correct pronunciation. Well, I was going to come onto the podcast with a hat in one hand and some glue in the other and say Hatsoglu, uh, but it wouldn't work for our audience that are just listening. So that's a good way to remember it, maybe. Peter, this has been extraordinary and a real privilege privilege for me. Do you have any concluding thoughts? Uh yeah, um, it's been great to come on, Laves. Um, and I suppose not long ago, you and I were playing together in the fourth eleven of Melbourne Uni. And um, yeah, and I guess if I were to if I were to leave people listening to this um, this interview with anything, I suppose it's just back yourself. You know, back yourself in. Um, if you're not going to you're not going to um, convince yourself that you're whatever you're doing is um, is something for you or, or at your level, I guess, then probably isn't. So back yourself in. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Hatsoglu. Thanks for having me.